Amen. So, so here we are in this series, and uh, we're in part two, and it's called Where Do You Draw the Line? Yeah, we started uh, last week talking about uh, this passage out of Philippians, actually several passages in Philippians, where Paul is talking about his life and our life in Christ, and it raises this question of going, okay, but what about? What about these other things that some of what he's teaching could be, uh, or at least seem to be in, in conflict with? And this weekend, as I was coming here, I was going by way of Dallas. I had a couple of meetings up there, and while I was... Uh, Going into Dallas, I had given myself lots of extra time just to find where I was going, and this huge storm hit. I don't know if you saw the news, but they were actually surveying all the damage from this storm in the last couple of days. And uh, so lightning is hitting on both sides of the road, and I'm, you know, in my car going, okay, I've got time, it's all right, and cars start to back up, and I look down just because of the traffic, and so I look down and I notice that my car is completely redlined, overheating. And so I pull over and, you know, downpour, and I watch lightning strike a little building right off the side of the road, and cars are pulling over just because of the storm. Of course, my car is completely overheated, and I watch it, you know, cool off just a little bit, and I start it up again and go a little further, and it starts to overheat again, and I pull back over. So I do that for a little bit, and I see off the road in the middle of the storm, there's a convenience store. I think, okay, maybe they have some coolant. I don't know what the problem is. I had had my oil changed when I was back home this week, and so I thought maybe they left the cap off and, I, you know, I don't know, didn't get it refilled, whatever. So I'm going to see if they have any coolant. So I get out of my car, lightning striking all over the place, rain, torrential downpour, run over to the uh, convenience store, run in. There's a bunch of people standing around getting protection from the storm, and I ask if they have any coolant, and I don't think so. You know, you're welcome to look, and so I start looking around, and there's one bottle of coolant they didn't know that they had, and uh, I'm thinking, okay, do I go back out in the middle of the storm and put up the hood, and you know, what do you, I've got this really, to me, a very important meeting I was very excited about. What do you, what do you do? Well, in the, in the midst of all of that, I wasn't going, Jesus, I just, you know, I just want to know you more. Mm. Uh, I, Jesus, you know, whatever you want to do, let me be hit by lightning. That would be fun. I'm, I'm not just going, you know, whatever you want to do. I'm thinking, get me out of this, you know? Get yeah. me to my appointment in time. Get my car working. Get me where I need to be. And that all worked out, barely, miraculously. But, you know, there, there's this extreme where sometimes we can come into church and we think, we hear, you know, we're just supposed to be happy with whatever God does. Anybody ever been unhappy with what God's doing? Anybody want something from God other than what maybe you think he wants from you in that moment, in that circumstance? Where do we draw the line between what it is that we want in our circumstance and what it is that God's doing in our life and circumstances? Where do we draw the line between sort of expecting what we think he's doing in our life to work out well versus trusting his sovereignty when things aren't working out well. And Paul's going to talk about this in Philippians 3 as we talk about it today. Yeah, and, and you might remember that last week we talked about two Gospels. You remember the prosperity Gospel? It says, uh, you've got little, but you need to have plenty. And then the other Gospel is sort of that legalistic Gospel that says, hey, you've got plenty, you shouldn't. You shouldn't have plenty, you should give it all up and have little. And so you see what both Gospels are saying. You need to change your circumstances to truly be okay with God. Mm. If you were truly walking with God and you had little, then you would suddenly have plenty. If you're truly walking with God and you've got plenty, then you should give all that up and now have little, and then you'll be really spiritual. And so what we've got is two messages that are super popular, and they're exactly what he's talking about. Change my circumstances, God. Prove to me that I'm in the right place, that I'm right, that I'm right, that I'm righteous. And so we're going to ask for changed circumstances or changed finances or changed issues going on so that we can suddenly get confirmation that he loves me, he loves me, he likes me, I'm right, I'm okay, I'm safe, I'm good. Um, and these Gospels are, are false Gospels. They're false messages. Because what we're talking about is that, you know, Paul says there's a secret to contentment. Whether you have little or you have plenty. It's not about changing your plenty to little or your little to plenty. It's about the secret of contentment, which is knowing Jesus Christ himself in any circumstance. And so world religions and religiosity, they want to change where you're at. And Christ is saying, I want to embrace you in the midst of where you're at. 
It doesn't mean your circumstances will never change. They might. But our hope is not in our circumstances. So here we are in Philippians 3, and it says this. It says, We are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more circumcised uh, the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, which is in the law. Well, my buddies, they found me blameless. Uh, they didn't know about my coveting, okay, but they found me blameless. And so this is the first passage we're going to touch on. And go for it with the questions yeah, there. Yeah, so here's a, a few of the questions we came up with. We thought, to what degree should we shy away from a flesh-based identity? We're, what we mean by that is identity from externals, right? My pedigree, my education, my accomplishments, my skill set, my family, my finances, my circumstances. To what degree should we shy away from an externally-based identity, a flesh-based identity. And the next question is, how do, we shy, how do we do that? So if we're supposed to not get identity from those things, how do we do that? And then where do you draw the line between those things that God has given us and associating with those things? Maybe it's your family or maybe it's something that God's done in your past. Do you get identity and value from those things or do you just reject all of that? Where do you draw that line? Yeah, and you can kind of see where, you know, maybe somebody's had an experience with the Lord or something that fascinated them, or they go, wow, look how God moved, and then they want that again, and they want that again, and they want that again, and so they're sort of getting their identity and worth from their story, their old, old story about what God did one time. So instead of living in the present, I'm going to go back and say, give me that circumstance again. Give me that experience again. Give me that miracle again. And so I live in the past rather than the present. So when we talk about not living according to the flesh, that might tie in, okay? But also, again, hear us loud and clear. We're not saying you need, you know, if you've got plenty, you need to have little, or if you've got little, you need to have plenty. We're not saying, oh, the real spiritual thing is to not care about anything, not care about money at all, or not care about your own life at all. No, as we saw last week, I mean, Paul says to be concerned not only for yourself, he says, yeah. but also for the affairs of others. So there's a martyr gospel out there that you need to be a martyr, that you need to be um, a doormat, that you need to be a, 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 a purposeful victim, that you put yourself in that victim flesh uh, scenario where everybody says, look at her, look at him, look how they're always thinking of, of others, never of themselves, what a servant, what a servant, and even that can be religious flesh. That can be religious flesh. And so what we're seeing is that it's like Baskin Robbins. There's 31 flavors of flesh, right? And so there's this flavor and that flavor. And uh, so when we talk about flesh, you know, I think it's really important to, to differentiate uh, our definition of flesh. I mean, Paul's definition of flesh here, um, you know, what he's talking about, Mike, is you've got this idea of, 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 of soulware. I mean, you've got uh, heartware right. and then you've got soulware. Right. And so we've got new hearts. You know you have new heartware? That becoming a Christian is you've got new heartware, but then there's the, the renewing of the mind, and that's the soulware. So there's heartware and soulware, and there's a difference there. We've got unrenewed mindsets, old programming, old networking, ways to get our needs met. That's fleshy, fleshy stuff. And the Lord's working on us with this, but it doesn't mean that our heart is dirty or wicked or bad or awful. Right, yeah, so, so here's the idea. There are things outside of what Christ has done by grace to give us value and identity in his choosing of us. I could easily feel good about myself because of things that are happening in my life. And what God wants to do is that, that soul wear that Drew's talking about, he wants me to identify with who I am in Christ, not what I want from him. I don't just, so as ministers, it'd be easy to say, well, am I a good teacher? Am I a bad teacher? I feel good about myself because I'm teaching well. I feel badly about myself because I didn't, you know, I didn't knock it out of the park today. 
And Jesus is going, no, you're equally called. You're equally mine. I, I died for you just as much for this day as any other day. I'm just as much yours. I'm just as much in you. Your identity is not in how well you served me today. Uh, the deacons that worked on the stage and are doing some other things uh, here, wonderful stuff. But if I'm doing that so that I can feel good about myself, I'm trying to be validated in my circumstances. Paul has said, you know what, if anyone could boast in anything external, in godliness that we're accomplishing, it's me. But God has given us a new way. We're a new creation living by a new economy that says there's greater value in Jesus having chosen you than anything you can do for him. And the other, the other thing, the flip side of this, the flip side of the flesh. See, we've just highlighted some religious flesh, some servant flesh, right. some martyr flesh. But, you know, a lot of us, we're not addicted to religiosity, maybe. A lot of us, we're not addicted to serving. Maybe a lot of us in the room, we're not addicted to uh, being a doormat. We have the flip side of the flesh. We've got stuff we're ashamed of. Right. We've got stuff we're embarrassed about. You've got a collection of sins that you allow the enemy to race through your mind, and you start to identify with that. Your resume is not circumcised the eighth day, the nation of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin. Right. Your resume is, gosh, I feel like a dirty, rotten, poor excuse for a child of God. Mm -hmm. And so we begin to fashion a different kind of resume. There's a flip side of the flesh, isn't there? Mm -hmm. So what I love about this is it doesn't matter which side of the flesh coin it is. Right. It could be the religious side of the flesh coin, or it could be the immoral looking uh, side of the flesh coin, but it's still the wrong coin. You need to Flick that coin away and, and take hold of the riches that we have in Christ as your identity. So do you see that we don't care how many millions of times you've sinned, and we also don't care how many millions of hours you've logged in church service. None of it means anything. It's about Jesus being your righteousness. And so the religious man has to come to the place where he says, I give up on this junk. It is not about me and what I'm doing for God. And the immoral person, the person stuck in, mired in immorality, has to come to the place of there's no life in this. There's emptiness. It all comes crumbling down. There's no meaning and purpose and significance in this. And so I want true life and true righteousness. Both people are coming to the same place, but they're coming from very different places. Right. And so there's the flip side of the flesh. Either resume, either resume is pointless, meaningless. And so the, the point is, are you drawing your identity, your purpose, your meaning from a heavenly place, or are you trying to get it on planet Earth somehow? Yeah. yeah there's uh, an interesting thing that happens. You know, the, uh, I'm a, from San Antonio. I'm a big Spurs fan. And when the Spurs win, everyone in San Antonio goes, we won! I'm thinking, how hard did you work to win that game? I, you know, I didn't even see you out there. Really, Mike? You won? Good job. I didn't even know you played basketball. You're not very tall. How did you manage? You know, we won. And then when they lose, what do we do? Oh, man, they played horrible. <laughs> they stunk it up. Yeah. Who's coaching them? You know? Right. Why? Because we're trying to associate. And we've got to be real careful that we're not putting Jesus Christ on our life like a name brand, right? We're trying to associate with him like Nike. Put, stitch him on our life and go, look, I'm a Christian. Or uh, try to cover up with Jesus Christ the things that we're doing that we don't think are very uh, appealing. So we're hiding in the sin as if it's going to uh, somehow deprive us of our validation. Or we're trying to hold this banner of, look, I'm a Christian as if we're doing something right. See, neither the positive flesh of the Pharisee or the negative flesh of the sinner has anything to do with where real life is. What you do does not produce life, and what you do does not cost you life. What Jesus Christ has done already is a finished work and wants to live out in and through you is his life, which is now your only life. It's very interesting, though, to watch the trends, isn't it, Mike? I mean, you watch the trends in Christianity today, and we, you know, we all operate in a fleshy way here or there. Nobody has the market cornered on truth. But you could divide, you could almost divide Christianity, Christendom down the middle. And you could say, 
look at all these guys who say that you should have cush circumstances, easy living, and a fat wallet. Right. And you then, must not be. You must not have enough faith because you've got problems in your life. Right. Right. Yeah. right. And then look over here. So your resume financially should change, or right. circumstantially, your resume. You know, Paul's resume looked right. really good. You need to look like Paul. Uh, you need to have a successful looking resume with the uh, circumstances, easy living, and a fat wallet. Or, hey, over here, you know, you couldn't possibly own these things, possess these things, and be super spiritual. You couldn't be spiritual. So we need you to give up these things. And if you will give these things up, kind of like Jesus talking to the rich man, right? Jesus is saying, sell everything. Well, that's like law 2.0. I mean, the rich man goes away sad from that message. He's proud. He's full of himself. Jesus picks the one thing he won't do to show him the true standard of righteousness. But that's not the gospel for today. Billy Graham does not stand in stadiums telling everybody to go home and sell everything. That's not the justification by faith that is the gospel. The gospel is a free gift. So watch this now. One gospel says change, change, change in this way. The other gospel says change, change, change in this way. And then the true gospel says, no, no, it's all for free. Do you believe that God is this good? Wherever you're at, whoever you are, whatever you have or don't have, Jesus Christ is free. And knowing him is a free gift by faith. Not just for salvation, but for every day, all day long. And when you go and grab a hold of these, you need to be different gospels. You need to be tweaking your circumstances. You need to be, well, then that's about you. It's not about the free gift of righteousness. So it's a bit tricky, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, and we're going to have to move on. But as you were talking, I, I thought, you know, there's also a counter to some of that. If, if I'm saying, okay, I don't have to go and change. I'm okay as I am. We don't want a passive Christianity either. We don't want to sit around and go, you know what, I'm okay with whatever I have and what I enjoy. So I don't want you to walk out of here going, hey, uh, what Drew's saying. I don't want you to walk out thinking, you know, I can't enjoy anything in life. That's sinful. I right. can't just, you know, I, I shouldn't go and play golf. That's not fair. Someone's starving on the other side of the, you know, city or planet or whatever. That one thing has nothing to do with the other. God is good and he can be good to you and you can receive that and that's wonderful. But on the other hand, if he really is enough for you, you can also afford to not do those things that you want to do. You can afford to be available for what God does want to do through you. So you can serve in the local church, but you gain nothing because you're serving the local church. You're just available. You have all things in Christ. You can go and have a wonderful meal at a fancy restaurant, but you don't have to to feel better about yourself. See the difference? You're not validating yourself by doing it, but you're also not validating yourself by not doing it. So it's not sense. about you. It's not about you at all. All of these things are neutral, and they're all useful in your relationship with God. So what we're seeing is that there's a get right with God message. And what mm. we seem to be saying is, what if you're already right with God? And what now? And then what now? Yeah. And then your choices come from a place of, I'm right with God from day one, moment one, instead of, I've got to choose all these things to get right. What if your heart is right? What if your spirit is right? What if the core of your being is right as a gift? And then you start to get to choose freely. You might, in a, in a, you might surprise yourself. You might be more generous than you were before. You might just be more loving than you ever were before. Because, you know, being right with God feels really good. Mm. You know, being right with God is a huge motivator. Mm. But I'll tell you that more than half of the Christians that I run into around the world, they're trying to get right with God. So they're operating from a deficit. Do you see that? Think when they I, are. They yeah. think they they're think operating they from yeah. a deficit. And so when I'm operating from a deficit, suddenly things become pressure-filled. Every decision is huge. What am I going to do if I choose wrongly? Mm. What does God think of me now? What does he think of me even now? And maybe it's changed in the last five minutes. It's very fragile. Like your relationship with Christ could go either way, any moment. Yes. What if it's solid? What if it's based on his faithfulness, not your faithfulness? Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, the question there, and I'll leave this up because I'm going to dive right into reading the next passage, but the question there, so how do you shy away from it? What if you don't have to shy away from the flesh? What if you just focus on Christ and let him be in charge of your life? What if he really is the goal and we put him in our sights and we don't make our flesh the obstacle that, it, that the enemy would love for it to be? Uh, Paul goes on from there. And uh, let's see, part of that's cut yeah, off I, there. I, actually, I, I'll read it for oh, you. Oh, okay, and great. It says, but whatever things were gained to me, uh, those things have, I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. 
More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. So uh, we've got these questions and I'll ask them to you. What, do you. what does it mean to abandon everything as a priority next to knowing Christ? And where, where would you draw the line in this abandoning everything? Yeah, Paul does this incredible thing in this passage. It, it's one of the most important passages in my life. Um, when he talks, in verse 7 specifically he says, uh, I count all of that as lost that I may know Christ. So here's the deal. What if, whether you play golf or you're coming here to serve and build a stage, your goal is not to have a great round of golf and enjoy yourself because you need to relax or you're going to have a bad week, and it's not to come and do something for God so that he'll bless your activity. What if both those comes become venues for you to know Jesus Christ more in your own experience? What if it is more about relating to life with Christ than it is doing things in order to get life from Christ? See the difference? What if you're going to walk with him and enjoy him and enjoy what he's doing in your life and enjoy whatever he puts in front of you, whatever door he opens to you? What if you get to actually relate to your circumstances from your position in Christ? And so when you go to play golf or when you come and work on the stage or when you go on a trip or when you're teaching Sunday school or when you're hanging out watching television, whatever it is that you're doing, what if all of those become the venue in which you get to experience Christ as your life? Paul said, I don't have 10 priorities, and Jesus is the first one. He said, I have one priority, and it's to know more Jesus Christ, who is already my life. So I want to fellowship with him even in his suffering so that I can experience more of this resurrected life that I have already by grace with him. See, everything becomes useful. Yeah, what I'm seeing is a total sellout. I mean, did you did you read this verse as carefully as we did? I mean, I, I see a total sellout here. Here's a guy who thinks it's all, all about Jesus, that that's the cream of the crop of human experience, yeah. that the cream of the crop is Jesus and knowing him. And so basically he says, I'm a sellout. Uh, it, it's like, try this on for size. Now, this is a real sellout. Try this on. I would rather be in hell with Jesus than in heaven with anyone else. Hmm. What? I would rather be in hell with Jesus than in heaven with anyone else. You know what that's saying? I'm willing, I'm so sold out to the idea of knowing Jesus Christ that I'm willing for it to be even wrong. That I, I would rather know Jesus and have made a mistake in knowing Christ than to fall for something else and then find out, well, I shouldn't have bought into Jesus anyway. That I would rather be in hell with Jesus than in heaven with anyone else. Now, don't get me wrong. If you know Jesus Christ, we believe 100%. We're sold out that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. But I ask you, I ask you, are you in this for the benefit of heaven? That's right. Or are you in, the, in this for the benefit of knowing Jesus Christ even now? Because if it's just about heaven, you got a lot of waiting to do. But if it's about knowing Jesus Christ as your life and that everything else stinks compared to knowing him, then have you come to that place where you're totally sold out to that idea? That doesn't mean commitment. It really means uh, what else is there? It doesn't mean doing for God. It means having a revelation that, whoa, there's no life outside of Jesus. So an idiot, an idiot would spend their time, waste their time elsewhere. So it's a coming to the knowledge that uh, Jesus has this market cornered on anything fulfilling. And that's what we're reading here. We're reading that Paul is not in this for some future destination alone. He's certainly not in this for better circumstances. There'd be a line out 66th Street if we were all getting better circumstances. But he's in this to get to know Jesus. And apparently he thinks that's as good as it gets. Yeah. Yeah, you know, here's what we tend to do. All of those fix your life this way or fix your life that way that Drew was talking about, those two false gospels, that if you're, you have a lot, you need to be a martyr and give up and suffer for Jesus. And if you don't have anything, then you need to 
uh, uh, have more faith so that God will give you all the stuff that you want. Both of those are versions of, of this. I can pursue God for what I want from him, mm. right? God, I'm doing everything you want me to do or I'm trying. You can't expect any more than what I'm doing, so I might be failing, but, you know, I can't help it. I, I can only do so much. I'm doing everything I know to do. Why are you allowing these three things in my life and why aren't you bringing these three things? In other words, I'm pursuing God for some other end besides God himself. And then the opposite is also true. We, we think, okay, I don't yet have him, so I'm going to do all of these things in order to get more of God. But what if you already have all of God and there is nothing better that you can get from him than God himself? What if Jesus Christ is already fully and completely yours and the best thing that you can gain is more experience, more life, more of him in your circumstances? What if there is nothing else? So instead of Jesus being the means to my own end in this life, or my own means in order to get more of Jesus as if there is any more, what if Jesus is both the means and the end of the Christian life? What if he, walking with him is the journey and experiencing and knowing him more is the destination? What if he is both the race we're running and the prize that we receive? What if Jesus Christ really is the way and the truth that we learn along the way and the life that we grow in as we walk along the way? What if he really is everything? Then we won't be trying to use him to get life from things that have no life. And we won't be living a life that has no life, an unlife, right? A zombie life. We won't be trying to do life in our circumstances in order to get more of him. We already have him, and there is no life apart from him. So rest. Mm. Rest. Enjoy what you've got in him. And don't mistake him as the way that you get something besides him. Mm. Rest with him so that in every circumstance you can know him more. Awesome. Amen. So we've been talking about, are you in this thing for some side benefit or are you in this thing for Jesus? Do you really believe he's enough? He said, come unto me. Don't come unto new circumstances. Come unto me and I will give you rest. Mm. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. But it's, it's through a true knowledge, Peter says. He says, it's a true knowledge of him. So some people have a false knowledge, a fake knowledge. They have a knowledge of him that there's going to be all these, this stuff on the side. I guess what we're, what we're reading today is it's a big invitation. It's an invitation to believe that we can be satisfied with Jesus. And if this message is right, if this message is right, if what we've said today is right, then it's going to work in southern India. It's going to work in the remote places of Africa, and it will work in the midst of people who believe in an American dream. Mm. But we dare not mix our American dream with the gospel because then we've got something that doesn't work elsewhere, and it's not from the God of the universe. It's about circumstances changing. Mm. Are you willing to believe in a gospel that hits the world in the same way worldwide, mm. that it's about a person and knowing him and that whether you have little or plenty, your Jesus is enough. Yeah. Let's pray together. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, we just thank you for the truth of it. Uh, we may have spent our lives trying to get more stuff, or we may have spent our lives trying to get rid of stuff to, to feel more spiritual. We may have spent our lives trying to shift our circumstances uh, to get you to like us, to get you to feel okay about us, to get ourselves to feel okay about us. In other words, we have been chasing after righteousness. We've been chasing after rightness. And we just want to confess right now that we believe that knowing Jesus Christ is the ultimate human experience. That whether we have little or plenty, we just want to know your son. We believe that knowing him and expressing him, it just doesn't get any better. Whether we live or die, whether this tent that we live in temporarily is destroyed or survives another day, whether we are sick or healthy, whether we are rich or poor, whether we are laying in the streets or experiencing some sort of uh, plenty, we just acknowledge that no matter what, in all circumstances, the secret of contentment is Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. You guys go ahead and stand with us.
say, great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's heart. You lead us by still waters and to mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people. Remember your children. Remember your promise, O oh God. celebrate moms today and just say thank you to the moms in our congregation. If you're not a mom, just have a seat for a minute. The little kids are coming forward. Moms, every mom standing, remaining standing. We have the kids coming around right now. Kids, find a mom who's standing up and give them a rose. We're celebrating moms today. Yeah, let's give them a hand. We're going to need, oh, it looks like we're going to need uh, another 90 seconds or so. We're not in a hurry. We're watching the kids come down, finding a mom. Anybody that's standing up, give them a rose. We're just, anybody that looks like uh, they're remotely a mom, standing up, if they're smiling, frowning, angry, frustrated, or elated, give them a rose. They need a rose. They deserve it. Celebrating moms. When you've got your rose, you can have a seat. Kids, find the, find the folks that are still standing. Go to the standers. You see them? They're over here. It's like an Easter egg hunt, only better. Find those moms. All right, one more round of applause for our moms. Well, today, we all received an invitation. We received an invitation to believe that our Jesus Christ, that he is enough. Whether we're going through sickness, whether we're going through turmoil, whether we're going through a time of plenty or a time of need. It's not about a change in circumstances. Sometimes God gives us that. He does. I mean, sometimes God brings relief. But sometimes you're the Apostle Paul firing up prayers, take this from me, take this from me, and nothing happens anytime soon. And then in the midst of that, Paul says, Jesus Christ, his grace is enough. There's a guy who actually believes that. And so we, we talk about the need to just rest in this Jesus that we know. I don't know your circumstances. We don't know where you're at. We don't have a one size fits all, but the God of the universe knows you and he wants to be life to you. Will you let him? Will you live loved? Will you receive his love? Will you get to know Jesus and just confess he is enough and nothing else compares to him? Have a great day.